Welcome to Unlikely Story, the new Tremendum podcast is our very first episode of Unlikely Story. Pretty that's, exciting. That's right. Super exciting. Uh, I am Travis Clough. And I'm Chris Loafing. We are uh, the co-founders of Tremendum Pictures, and we are the hosts of Unlikely Story that you're listening to now. And uh, we are viral content creators, and we are filmmakers. We have done several uh, feature films that have landed studio releases. Done a lot of random stuff, but we're very excited about this podcast, and we're very excited to be um, telling our story about how we got started in the industry. Yeah, it's interesting because we are not the kind of people that assume anyone really cares or wants to hear from us. But what <laughs> we found is that there are a lot of people that do and have said, yeah, I've followed you guys. I've, I've heard your story. I've been inspired to pursue my dream even further. And yeah. And uh, some of these people we've ended up even working with, which is really cool, and uh, just had a great experience with them. And we hope to have them on as guests. I'm, I'm sure we will. And we've told our story many times, but never kind of on our own terms, I feel never like. Never for ourselves or- For ourselves. Or, or on our own. Yeah. It's always been in, uh, you know, at a event to a group or something. And School we, kids, you know, yep. inspiring youth and, um, you know, or on other podcasts or uh, interviews. With a set the, time but, limit, but there's no time limit this time. Yeah. You hear that? No time limit. We can hey, we're go, not gonna for go forever. Hours. We're not going to go forever. Forever. But. <sighs> <laughs> no, we won't go forever, but we can include all the juicy details that we've left out every other time. Yeah, and we can maybe clear some things up that are reported incorrectly or whatever. There's always flubs or little things. Uh, I, I think I didn't realize how, you know, not to say that fake news is a, as big of a thing as people think, but it really is a weird thing. There's a lot of stuff that gets misreported or, and good journalists will try to nail it, but there's a lot that just kind of throws stuff in and it's like, I didn't say that. Chris didn't quote that. Yeah. That happened a lot too. So it was weird just for us little guys, you know, that were, you know, misquoted here and there. Anyway. That's very true. Um, we're we're going to dive right in, but I want to remind everyone too, the reason we've started this podcast is honestly, not only to tell our story, which we're going to do here in a moment, but also to inspire all of you out there who are upcoming filmmakers, storytellers, writers, actors, uh, entrepreneurs, directors, go-getters in general, anyone creators, yeah. who has a dream. To create create something or do something uh, that seems impossible, um, this podcast is hopefully for you that you will get inspired by our Cinderella story, how we were able to do something with nothing and make something out of uh, literally just you know duct tape and some paper clips. And yeah, we had to string. MacGyver. <laughs> we had to MacGyver a whole bunch of stuff in order to make it to where we've made it thus far. We still. Don't get me wrong. Don't think that once you've MacGyvered it and you've kind of made it in a, in a little way that you ha can stop and relax. Uh, there's 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 so much to continuing to push through and, and stay motivated because uh, as we've heard in other great speeches about filmmaking, the cavalry isn't coming. Oh, you have yeah. to continue working hard and making it happen unless you've reached... Dwayne Johnson status, you know, <laughs> Ryan Reynolds status, you know, then it's like, you just, you're just stupid money's coming in and you can do whatever you want and it will just be like money raining down. To on be you. clear, that is not us. <laughs> we are that, not that at that not status us. yet. We're still indie guys scraping together what resources we can to make cool stuff. But we're in the way, in the process of reaching that and we're on our way towards reaching that we have to continue to uh stay focused and motivated though That's right and we hope to encourage others to do the same because the goal is attainable it's reachable and you can do it and we are going to have guests on here as well from time in future episodes um sharing their stories and helping inspire as well but for us right now it's just travis and myself so without further ado let us tell you our story of how we started in this business in this crazy industry and or how uh, we didn't start in this business. That's true. That's that's a great way to put it, actually. How we started as far outside of this business as you as could possibly did, yeah. do. And uh, and and here we are today. Um, I guess I'll start. So I'm from Nebraska originally, um, from a small town called Beatrice, Nebraska, 12,000 people. This town is known for farming. Nebraska is known for football. E everything uh, probably opposite of movies or cinema. Um, I didn't have any film classes, no video classes, no editing courses or any access to anything like that in school. Just, um, I always loved movies though, growing up. I had a, just a love and appreciation for movies because I wasn't really into sports. I wasn't into football like most 
people in Nebraska were. Yeah, you were you were like the kid with the video camera at yeah, the school, and right. everyone was like, "Oh, he's doing stuff with video." Exactly, and I even got um, brought on to film like my uh, the high school football games. You know, the senior okay, games all the and videography stuff. stuff. Yeah, I did that in my senior, junior, and senior year, I think, and it was it was pretty fun. But um, you made a movie though. I did. When I you were in high school, a full feature length. That caught the ire of Warner Brothers, That's no less, right? right? <laughs> well, is that the so second one? Or that the was the second one. The okay, talk about the first. The first one I, one I did was a fan, um, a fan film. I guess it was it was an homage to Halloween to Michael Myers. Mm -hmm. I made my own Halloween movie, starring me, edited by me, shot by me. Uh, I die in the movie, you know. <laughs> like uh, it was it was a lot of fun, and I learned a ton. And this was just after I had gotten my first digital camera. Before that, I was filming on those little mini tapes. Oh. Yeah, they were mini DVs. You had oh to, like, my gosh! You had to put them into like a bigger VHS thing, and like then, cassette like, tapes. Yeah, for those of you of my generation, most people like... probably don't even know what the heck I'm talking about right yeah. here. Um, but after I'd done some skits and stuff on the tapes, I got a digital camera, and I and this was high school. I was probably a sophomore or junior. Got a digital camera planned out this entire feature length film and I went and shot it with my uh with my friends just high school friends the uh, guts to do that though just so people understand we always give praise to even the worst of movies yes because <laughs> what are you trying to say about my movie no I'm not <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty bad guys it, was no, pretty, it wasn't that no, great <laughs> but no making a terrible movie <laughs> is a miraculous feat. It's a it's a miracle to even get a bad movie made. So right? it's like we have to like give a certain level of appreciation to anyone that even goes for it. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's why you have these movies that actually have turned into great movies, like like The Room or <laughs> Troll Two or you know some of these yeah. movies that are so bad that they're good. Yeah. Because and it's not because they are good. It's because the heart behind them was so. Real and legit. Anyway, yeah. continue. Uh, Sorry. Uh, that's something you won't hear us do much on this show, I hope, is bash movies, anyone's movies, because like Travis said, yeah. it's an amazing feat to get one made. Anyway, I made this movie. It was a full-length movie. I I had it finished, edited, and I said, okay, well, I want to show it to my friends, you know, the people who helped me make it and, you know, my closest friends. So I invite 20 of my closest friends over. We're just piled in the living room, you know, gathered around our TV and um, I play the movie for him. And by the end, there's this great end bit where Michael Myers dies, of course, but he, of course he's not really dead. Mm -hmm. And my friend Steve uh, Glore's on the phone and he's got in this scene, he's like, wait, what? She's pregnant? You know, <laughs> like, like setting up that there's another heir to the Michael Myers li lineage. Oh, uh, yeah. And in the background, you see Michael Myers just sit up. Like he just like goes, you know, <laughs> and looks at Steve. And then the movie ends. And uh, the whole room just stood up and started clapping and cheering. And they were like, sequel, we need another one. Like right away. Yes. Yeah. And it was in that moment that I knew I had to make movies the rest of my life. Not that you had <laughs> effed up. Not that yeah. in that moment he knew he had not screwed up, but he had succeeded. Yeah. So I then I went on and made another film uh, in my senior year. That was the one that it was an homage to The Dark Knight, which had just come out, which was a huge hit, obviously. And I was such a huge Batman fan growing up. I made a, a film that was the I made Joker before, before Joker. Joker. It I, was a standalone. It Joker. was a standalone Joker movie. Origin story. An origin story that told the like how he became the way he became the, more of the Heath Ledger Joker because that that was you know fresh Dark Knight had come out but the story of the Joaquin Phoenix Joker meaning like how he kind of exactly came into where he was but it was very similar like he was he was harassed he was bullied he was you know had some mental issues some and abuse, stuff like uh, abuse uh, 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 and stuff it was pretty similar things. and I made this movie in high school again with just friends local friends and um, I showed it at the local high school. I was going to charge admission <laughs> and, uh, and, um, was it at the high school or the movie it theater? It was at the high school. At the this high school, is the okay. one that someone in town got wind of this and called Warner Brothers. Some they just, called Warner Brothers. Some just weird random Karen <laughs> yeah, or, or yeah. <laughs> what's the guy, what's the guy's version of that? No, what's the guy's version? Of Noah, a Karen. Noah's our sound guy and our, uh, our op, our technical advisor. We'll call him Karen, call him, call Karen or, or, or I don't know what it is. Well, anyway. To hook us up. Tell us in the comments so we don't yeah. forget next time. But uh, 
I, someone called Warner Brothers, legitimately called Warner Brothers, and my principal, my high school principal, comes up to me at this screening. He's like, "Hey, we got the, we got a call today from uh, from Warner Brothers, and yeah, they're not they're not happy about you charging admission to the." I was like, "Oh," and he's like, "We can still do it. Let's just let's just call it free." And we just added a free screening, and so it was a free screening of my movie Joker. It was called Joker. It was That's literally so called funny. Joker. It was the same time. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I don't think you can see it anywhere. I don't have it anywhere online. I have DVDs of it, but it's pretty funny how- Who was in it? So the person that starred as the Joker was my buddy, Jesse Cross. Yes. Who, okay. I thought that's who it was. It was fun. I, I actually did end up screening it at the local movie theater as well. And um, and that was a blast. I have my movie on the big screen as a high school senior. I mean, it was so cool. That's great. I, I do. That makes me want to talk about something real quick that we'll get into- in greater detail in other podcasts, but it's it's what you did and what a lot of people are afraid to do is basically break some rules, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> you you got to not be afraid to break some rules. I mean, if we're talking about like things are so tight right now that what some of the early greats did to get into the industry, it's just, there's no way it's going to happen. Steven Spielberg illegally snuck onto the Universal mm-hmm, back Studios lot. back lot and like- Came on to things as though he was a filmmaker, a decision maker, made making, as if he worked there, yeah. <laughs> as if he worked there. And the security there is so tight now; it can never be done. There's no way that another Steven Spielberg story could happen. But there's also a lot of things with copyrights and 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 music licenses and this and that, and a lot of stuff that is get people are tightening up much more, like early YouTube days and early uh, early YouTube, basically. Mm-hmm. People were able to use and do a lot of stuff, and uh, and now it might it might be overwhelming for someone to think, oh, there's so many licenses, all these things that I have to do now, and YouTube has really tamped down on a lot of that stuff. Yeah. So, but I think people still need to just create and then find a way out of that. You yeah. Know, don't be afraid to break rules. We've we've done it, and that helped us create the gallows and and not not break rules in a dangerous way, but 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 challenge the norms or the regular stuff, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, Yeah. If you always stay inside the lines, it's like you're, you're, you're never going to create anything new or, or, or really tap your true original. Yeah. Original. Um, Well, from there, from that cease and desist order, from the cease and desist order, I screened my film and then I, I graduated and I went to film school. I went out to film school in Los Angeles, uh, the New York film Academy, but it was the Los Angeles office, which is growing and and has become quite big and successful film school. Um, I just did a one year program. Uh, it was a big change for me going from little town Nebraska to big LA. Um, very cult, a big culture shock. You got a scholarship too. I did. I got a grant from um, Brett don't, Ratner. <laughs> don't, don't be afraid to say who, who Brett it came Ratner, from. which is a little bit of a yeah, taboo name now, but it definitely helped cover one of my semesters, and then I got other scholarships to help cover the rest. And it was a great time. I did one year there, general filmmaking, and my thesis film um, brought me challenges because I was doing something very ambitious. I was trying to make a superhero movie on a nothing budget. The school doesn't give you money. They just give you cameras and gear and and your crew. I just had no money and no locations. And I, I didn't want to film this in an apartment. I needed like legit places. And I had a classmate. He's from Kingsburg, which is in central California. It's south of Fresno, about 20 minutes, I would say. Yeah. And he said, he says, Chris, why don't you try going checking out Fresno? I bet you will find a bunch of cool locations. I bet permits are free. It's only three hours north. Go go check it out. And Matesh, who was my DP, had just filmed something in Kingsburg. And he was like, dude, I think this you could find some cool stuff in Fresno. And I was like, okay, well, I'll come check it out. So I came up to Fresno with uh, another classmate. And we started just looking around. I got connected with a few different people and just a bunch of cool places in Fresno. And they were all free. Yeah. I kid you not. Everything was free. All I had to do is fill out a simple one page film permit. Well, we had a, our mayor at the time was Alan Autry, a former actor, and he was really trying to bring some more stuff in. Yeah. And and the efforts were, they were good in that you came up and were able to do a bunch of things, but it's still been a little bit slow, although we have seen some growth since, since the gallows came yeah. out. We've seen a bunch of people kind of moving in the direction. Again, I think a lot of people have been inspired here locally to 
start creating films and doing things. So it's really neat to see where that's come from since that time. Yeah. But, Fresno is where we still are, in case you haven't yeah. guessed yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is Fresno. Um, but anyway, I, I found everything I needed here in Fresno for my thesis. And I was super pumped. I came up, made the short. And in the process, I was casting stunt guys. I needed some thugs for um, several different scenes. This is, of course, a superhero movie. I need guys to get beat up. I need guys to get thrown onto stuff. And that is where Travis comes into the picture. This is Look, where I came in. Him flexing over there. If you can't my, see. Yeah. But those who are muscle. just listening don't get the me, pleasure of me, seeing that. Oh, me, yeah. You know. <laughs> push my arm underneath my bicep to make it look larger than it really is. Boom. Yeah, it was uh it was a good time. Uh I remember I remember it like it was 10 plus years ago. <laughs> <laughs> 10 plus years ago. Cuz it was, but uh it was interesting at the time because I was uh, I was super impressed with Chris cuz uh, he looked so young. He was 19 at the time and my first question to him was, "How old are you?" First words to me. Yeah, which well, this was 2010, 2010, I believe. I think so. Uh, Either yeah. nine or ten, I can't remember. 2009 or ten. Uh, but it was just incredible to see the amount of drive and persistence, and like just knowing what he wanted to do. I mean, that's really where, for me, I was just like, dang, this kid knows exactly what he's trying to do, and he's in charge, and he's focused, and he's driven. And I, I had already been through a bunch of different like career choices and. A bunch of different things. Well, so to start out for me, like in, I want to say 2007, I had uh, been working like in long-term retirement planning, insurance, mortgages, all kinds of stuff. And I had just a slew of unfortunate events uh, <laughs> kind of hit me and take place in my life and made it difficult for me to um, just to do anything financially. Mm -hmm. um, I basically, I had invested in a company that was buying and flipping properties uh, in, in Georgia. It was a client of mine and my brother's at the time. And uh, he showed us like these returns on his investment. And I was like, well, shoot, why am I not doing this? I, I had my first child on the way and uh, I was trying to like get ahead and all this stuff. So I invested in this company thinking it would be all good. And, and, Six months down the road, had received several returns already, and then I, I, uh, you know, I got into some debt. I took out some credit card debt and a second on my house, and I, I put that towards this investment, thinking well, six months I'll have a hundred percent return. I'll just pull everything out, pay that off, and I'll be ahead by this amount of money, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure enough, when I when I had finally fully loaded it up, and we did all the research too. I mean, you did Dun and Bradstreet ratings, it, all, all the different ratings companies, it, Wall Street Journal, Newsweek. It was it was all being advertised in these things, and there were no indicators. It's like, and we came to find out later on that the SEC uh, and the government regulators were all asleep at the wheel or <laughs> who, doing who knows what on their computers. Uh, uh, other than protecting the people from these types of things, because several of these came out, uh, but it was a Ponzi scheme and, and it wasn't the Bernie Madoff one, but shortly after Bernie Madoff situation happened, a couple, several others that I heard about Gosh. happened and they froze all the assets and all the money that went into this fund. And how much were you in the hole at that time? When over, that Over six figures. Oh my God. Over six figures. We'd never had any debt uh, before except for our cars and the house. So we didn't have any debt, but- um, I pulled out, you know, like 50 in a home equity line and sent it over. And then I had three or four credit cards that I'd maxed out to just put in and then, uh, get the returns. It was 25% every two months. So in six months, we're talking about like letting it roll over. We would get like a hundred percent return. So it was, it was insane, mm -hmm. but they were buying and flipping properties. The real estate market was huge in 2007, but uh, to add insult to injury, once in 2007, they shut everything down. The Securities and Exchange Commission finally did. They also, that's like the housing bubble happened mm, like the yeah. next year. And so no one was able to sell any of the properties, all this stuff. It, it was just, it was insane. And uh, I was just in the hole for a long time. Uh, first kid on the way. The first kid on the this way. This 2008? 2007, eight ish. Okay. And in 2008, we saw this ad. And this is going to, this is, you're going to like this, guys. Uh, we'll have to play the clip. We'll have to play the clip on this. I had seen an ad and my wife and I were watching an ad for this new game show uh, uh, and it was called Wipeout. It was Wipeout on ABC. 
Why, pal? Yeah, and uh, it's so funny because I didn't want to do Fear Factor because you have to eat cockroaches and do all that kind of weird stuff and all that kind of stuff, Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> Fear is not a factor Fear for me. is never a factor, Joe Rogan. <laughs> Anyway, the um, quotes that we use still uh, to this yeah, day and yeah. on every set. I got, I can't eat all of it. <laughs> Old Dave Chappelle. <laughs> I can't eat all of it. Oh, so, so I smell somebody cooking. Richie, uh, Richie, and all of our original crew members on the gallows are cracking up right now. Yeah, we yeah. said this stuff all. Okay, wipe out, wipe out. And so this show looked a lot like a lot of fun because it was, uh, it was all the obstacles, none of the gross stuff. And uh, it was based after that other show, uh, Most Extreme Elimination Challenge, <laughs> yeah, which was, was so hot at the time. And, and my wife and I watched that and enjoyed that a lot, too. Uh, but I said, you know what? I I'm hurting. I need a lot of money. Uh, and I, I, I bet I could win something like that. And, and my wife agreed. She says, I think you could, too. And if I could just chime in, too. Travis is extremely agile and squirrely. Like, he, when you, when you look at you, you're not like... You think oh, okay, just an average dude. Like you don't, you're not. But like, what? He's, I'm offended by that. <laughs> okay, but yeah, cut back to the the bicep shot that just yeah. earlier. Ugh. He can like maneuver and do crazy things that like most people just can't figure out with their with their limbs. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it. The truth is, I feel like I am capable of doing anything. <laughs> I, like I if believe it's you climbing are. a fence a certain way, if yes. it's if it's jumping through uh, something that doesn't seem like it should be able to be fit through. If it's throwing something a certain way, like I feel like I can do all that stuff. And this is going to come into play later as we get further into our story. Well, we talk about as how Travis literally does all the crazy stuff on set. I like I become <laughs> I have become like the go to guy Swiss for Army knife <laughs> weird stuff uh, but, that needs to get done on sets. But how did Wipeout go? So I uh, I auditioned for Wipeout. Uh, I uh, you know we. We thought it would be the greatest to win fifty thousand bucks if I could do it. That would certainly help. And um, fifty thousand is the grand prize. That's the grand prize for the champion. Mm -hmm. And so I went down, and uh, they loved me. I gave them what they wanted—a memorable character. And um, what, what was your nickname? My nickname. The two Johns up in the booth had <laughs> most graciously given me uh, the nickname Super Shorts, yeah. and it it has to do not just with me being a superhero. But how short my shorts actually were. <laughs> uh, they were dangerously short. Yeah. And uh, it showed. And I mean, the shorts, the dangerously short <laughs> yeah, shorts nothing else, showed. Nothing, nothing else showed. Thankfully, just to nothing be else absolutely showed. clear. <laughs> Thankfully, nothing else showed. I have to do the little um, blur of the pixel. <laughs> yeah, the pixels on that. Uh, I went on the show. And this is an interesting bit about this show that's cool. That The director, Matt Kunitz, I believe is his name. He was also the, the uh, creator behind Fear Factor. And he had said, this was season two, mind you. Season one had already filmed. And I was the first at the first episode of season two to film. Mm -hmm. And we're in this trailer with all these other people, like this one lady in bubble wrap. She she did all this stuff to get on the show and, and bubble wrapped herself. And they, they cut her completely out of the episode. <laughs> so that was hilarious. Um, but totally 80s Chelsea, uh, Ninjetta, you know, uh, there were a bunch of really cool characters. But I was an alternate. Oh, yeah. On my episode. And so I was just waiting to see if someone didn't show up or whatever. And uh, You hadn't officially been selected I had, yet. I hadn't officially been selected. I just thought, oh, shoot, well, I'm just going to leave. That's a bummer. And, but this is interesting. So before I found that out, the, the creator of the show, Matt, came up and he says, you know, it's funny. We've been able to tell just by looking around every time we filmed an episode, who would win that episode? I don't know if there's something in the air or whatever it was about it, but he he was like, "Yeah, we just we kind of just guess." He's got that spidey sense because there's a vibe, yeah. And 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 the, and the thing is, they don't do anything to help anyone. They they do the opposite. Like, <laughs> they make everything super hard. Yeah, so it's not uh, it's not like you can. And they their best practices were to draw names, so it was all above board. And uh, they he said, "But we are not sure who's going to win this one." Hmm. We have, we're looking around. We can't see any kind of clear indicator. We, we don't know on no this standout. episode who, no who, who's going to win. And uh, then he left to go do something else. And then uh, they they started to draw names. They had done roll call, uh, obviously, but they started to draw names. And they said, all right, so we're going to pick the name who goes first. And they pulled the name out of the hat. 
and they kept saying the name and it was some guy and he wasn't actually there. And I was packing up, getting ready to leave. And they're like, wait, Travis, uh, this guy didn't show. I guess, I guess you're going first. You're on. And I was like, <laughs> oh, crud. Okay. I'm going first. And, uh, so I remember getting out on the top of the hill and you can see I'm doing this. I, I end up doing this, you know, splits and then the backspin kind of a thing. And, and, uh, I, they asked me to do it a few more times while I was up there. But while I was there, I looked down from this kind of hilltop and I could see that the trailer where we were. And there was this guy, this kind of big, like really red looking guy. And he was like yelling and stuff. And apparently it was the guy who didn't show up that I was oh, subbing really? for. He came back. I didn't know if you heard this. I have not heard this part. He, uh, right. So he had driven back from Mexico at, like he was in Mexico, what? like partying or something. <laughs> he was like drunk. They had to like escort him off the set and boot him out of there. Really? And, and wow. he was all fired up. And uh, uh, he's just like, looked like, like beat red, you know, like been in the <laughs> Probably sun. All like, oh, you know, like, like it was crazy. But I saw that and I was like, oh shoot, like, am I still going to get to go? Anyway, I ended up going. We were in the trailer still. Uh, and they said, Travis, you're going first. I said, oh, shoot. Okay. So I got ready. And then the director, Matt, came back in and he said uh, he had found out that you were going that I was actually going to be on this show then. Mm -hmm. He walks by me and he says, well, now we know who our winner's going to be. Mm. Now we know who our winner's going to be. Now we know. Now I knew I was going to win. <laughs> I had been sizing everyone up. Yeah. I'm looking at bubble wrap girl and I'm going, I'm going to pop all your bubbles. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're going to drown in that. Uh, I'm looking at uh, the angry man guy and I'm going, dude, you're, you're going to be even more angry when I just blow right past you. And, um, and then what happened? How did it go? Well, I got the best times on just about everything. I like leap. I did crazy things that no one thought could even be done. There that was these, frog, yeah. there are these blocks. They fall into the water, and I actually was able to leapfrog around on them, like like lightly touching them, like a ninja would, to go around people that were taking too long on the actual bridge it's area. It's a moment straight out of a movie. It's like the moment where. Oh no, the bridge is collapsed. The road is blocked. Totally. And then the hero takes a totally different route that's not even on the course. Totally. Like, that's exactly what this moment was. I feel like I was crouching tiger hidden dragon <laughs> walking on a bamboo shoot. Yeah. And I, I just, I tiptoed across these things and like they just pew, 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 across the water just so lightly. Or you... Remo Williams. That's another classic. Remo Williams. If you haven't seen that one, he like, he walks across the the concrete without leaving marks. And then you got ahead, cement. right? Like you're, you. Improved. And then I actually got ahead of them. I did need to go back and go one more time on that one. Uh, and then, uh, and but then I won. I, I made it through to the third round. The third round was a tough one. I actually like, I just almost completely lost all my strength in a couple moments. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then I somehow just in my heart and mind and willed myself up from the most <laughs> awkward position. I was like oh, this. Yeah, that one. <laughs> I was like this. And I was trying to like- It's like a big foam pad. Yeah. You know, when you're like this, you, it's, you can't like pull yourself up. You have to have all this strength up in these areas. And, <laughs> and I did not have that. So I was like, and if your waist goes halfway in the water, one of the rules was you had to let go yourself back. go and go back to the oh, beginning yeah. of that portion of the obstacle. So I ended up- uh, willing myself up out of that and uh, getting on and then moving on to the next round and then the qualifier. And then I dominated the qualifier, uh, not the qualifier, the uh, shoot, the, the wipeout zone. The wipeout zone. Then I took on the wipeout zone and, and, and dominated that. Uh, and it was, I got one of the fastest times, I think of all the wipeout champions. So that's amazing for my particular obstacle course, but it was awesome. And I won the 50,000 bucks. He won. And with Woo! that, with that 50,000, I was able to settle a bunch of debts and then still be in the hole a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a taste for film and the crew and sound and emergency services and just the whole vibe of being on a set. And that's where I said, I have to do this. Mm -hmm. I have to figure out how to do this. And so I started writing my own first movie. Uh, uh, and I just said, I'm going to ask friends to help me, uh, figure out how to film it and do all this stuff. And that became my film school. Uh, and, uh, in that process is when I heard about this kid coming to Fresno to film his thesis and he needed stunt guys. And so me 
now being a wipeout champion, professional stuntman. I am now a professional stuntman. <laughs> I have I have done it all. I have uh, uh, taken the mantle of a professional stuntman. Now I, we know stuntmen now that would be like now Travis. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but uh, it was it was great. So I did stunts for Chris's thesis film mm -hmm. and cross it was what it was called cross, cross. Yeah. yeah we should show a couple clips of that because oh man i, I could just say too in the, for the wipeout thing you you touched on this but i think it's crucial and we'll come back to it again but you went into that with not just the desire to win but the intention and you knew it was going to happen totally you you, you weren't just doing it to s with the mindset of like oh let's see what happens no you were going in with the Absolutely. mindset of i'm going to win this i am going in i'm getting goosebumps i'm getting goosebumps right now those of you who are listening let me just say it i'm <laughs> i'm getting goosebumps he's right goose now he's goose bumping i'm goose bumping but yeah i i went there and it was a a clear intention to win and and it was uh I mean, it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. There's no other way that Matt Kunitz, the the program director, would have known or felt that. Other mm -hmm. people told me too. It's like, yeah, yeah. We once you were in, we thought you, and then after the qualifier, we're like, oh yeah, that guy's gonna win, right? You know. And uh, they told me that after like two or three obstacles, and I was just like, oh, sweet. Well, still got one more to go. Yeah. But I was. It was a determination to win, and nothing was gonna stop me. Nothing was gonna get in the way. Uh, nothing was going to tell me otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, and if something did come up, some hurdle or something, I was just going to jump right over it. Right. And it was also, like you said, your first exposure to the entertainment business or industry. As a business, yeah. As yeah. a business and as a career. Because yeah. you had just, like as Travis said, he had just – you know, suffered this huge, you know, catastrophic oh, event yeah. with his career and his Total life. Total career and, change, totally and, lost all that. Desire and what a, all what that a stuff. serendipitous window into something new. You know, and look, I mean, if, if you, if you pay attention to this podcast for any duration of time, you're going to come to understand that I'm a, I'm a believer. Uh, Chris and I are both believers. And I feel like I was headed one direction and all this crap happened to me in my life. And, and I needed God's help or his hand to just smack me onto a different path or yeah. something. And, and maybe that's what it was. And so I look back at the troubles that I had with that, that Ponzi scheme and the different career path as things that I was, I was on the way to pursuing long term. Mm -hmm. But I might not have felt as fulfilled. So going through that train wreck of debt and all those things, which thankfully I'm out of now. And we were able to get out of that and without doing bankruptcy or any of that stuff. Um, and, but man, you know, strike me down if it wasn't God helping me onto a different path mm -hmm. and helping me get out of my own way to, to, uh, you know, to focus on something that was going to bring me a lot more fulfillment and also, meet you, uh, be able to do these other creative things with my family. I mean, we got a lot of really fun stuff and to work with the people that we've come to know and love mm -hmm. that none of this would have happened Which, had I not been kicked while I was down. Exactly. Exactly. It, it opened a, a totally new door for you that you never would have found on mm -hmm. your own in that way. Which this is a great segue into really where our journey together began um, as Tremendum Pictures. After Travis created, uh, started creating his film, Gold Fools, um, which was a great family film, as he said, his film school, um, Travis asked me to help edit Gold Fools. And I, That's right. we had finished Cross. And uh, Travis actually came down and saw the premiere uh, of Cross at the Warner Brothers lot, which was awesome. That was, was one awesome. of the funnest things. I had never been on the Warner Brothers lot, I don't think. And me I neither. I was just stoked to to be there and to kind of be soaking it in and and we this is so funny cuz we sat through a bunch of student films and you could tell they were all still learning but Chris's was miles ahead of everyone else's the score was amazing an amazing composer Zach Lemon did a great Zach job Lemon. on that it was so good and then you had um you had just the editing it was brilliant, and the storytelling was far and above all the others. In fact, it was the only one that got a standing ovation <laughs> in right. the whole thing. That was overwhelming, man. That was an overwhelming evening. 
but it was awesome. And I'm, we we went pr- out and took a picture. That's right. At the uh, at, with one of the WB logos out in front of the cafeteria. The cafeteria. Man, you got to see us because there's we, spring chickens. We, yeah, we were just just youngsters, uh, just young go get ragamuffin. We had just we were we had not known each other for very long in the, in that picture, and then we'll come back to this and show where it goes from here because this is kind it of comes a fun, full circle full that's circle. a full circle on that but ap- after that event which was a ton of fun that's when we started tremendum pictures our, our production company together um we started it up formed the llc you know it was official in the state of california um yep and our first movie together or our first idea for a movie together was for The Gallows, originally called Stage Fright, uh, was the original title of The Gallows, if you didn't know that, yep. Stage Fright. And it went through many a title change before eventually coming back to The Gallows, um, which we'll get to. But Stage Fright was what it was originally called. And at the time, it was just, this, this was 2011, the big uh, genre at, uh, at the megaplexes was found footage. Oh, yeah. It was super hot because Paranormal Activity had just hit and it was like all the rage, right? I think it was around the time the second one had come out or was coming out and it was just, you know, larger than life, this found footage genre. Oh, it had broken all kinds of records for for uh, production budget to box office ratios and all that. Yeah. And as we were developing this idea, Travis and I, um, it wasn't necessarily because found footage was all the rage, although that was a factor, we started to lean towards found footage mainly because we had no money and we had no help resources. Like this is I, true. All I true. moved. I moved up to Fresno. Uh, I had convinced Chris to leave LA. Yep. To move up to Fresno because I was still in debt. Uh, this was 2010. I mean, I still the winnings. The winnings helped settle several debts, but. We still were, you know, we had to move out of our house. We had to downsize. We had to do a bunch of stuff. And by that time, I had another another child. Yeah. Um, you had Trey because I – Carlos and Trey. Carlos and Trey. And uh, and it was like uh, I need help paying rent, you know. <laughs> like so even your 150 bucks a month or I was happy was to pay great. less rent too. What happened was essentially we were driving up to film something for Gold Fools. Yep. And we were talking about this stage fright thing. And you were really stewing on it. And uh, it didn't leave you until we actually got it in script form or in, uh, you know, an outline form and had something that we could really go shoot. And so I commend you for taking the idea that I had and really like making sure that it was seen all the way through to the end. And that's that's actually how Travis and I work a lot. Will Travis is very much the ideas guy. And... Um, I will, I will often take those ideas or the ones that really stick with me and I'll just keep thinking about them and developing them and adding to them in my brain. And then I'll come back to Travis and say, hey, what do you think about this or this or this? And he'll be like, oh, yeah, or eh, maybe not that, but that was cool. And yeah. then we just start kind of building on it. But Travis is definitely the ideas guy. And um, this this particular idea, the gallows, we, we, we knew we wanted to do something cheap because we had no money and we wanted it to be uh, PG-13. That was the, always the Absolutely. goal. The, the goal was always to make this movie for high school kids. And with the concept of kids being trapped in their school theater, it was a perfect you know fit for that demographic. So we came up with this idea of the hangman. And yeah, because we had heard that if you had like pooling red blood or uh, or like stab like knife stabbings and red blood, that that would give you kind of an automatic R rating and right, stuff, and right. so we thought, well, what can we? What kind of weapon could our our villain use that would, uh, you know, not get it an R rating? So we thought, oh, you know, does he use a, a noose? A, yeah, we ended up coming up with a <laughs> noose. Yeah, but it was all kinds of a, the axe, the the morning stars, the battle, <laughs> axe, you know, like all all the other stuff, bow and arrow, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then the noose, it was like, oh man, I've never seen anyone never seen that. with a, a noose as their mode of, of murder. Right. And we thought for sure that would cut down the gore and all that stuff to make it for sure be a PG-13. And we were really trying to merge two worlds. We were trying to take the iconic slasher t- type movie, and but also the paranormal movies that had started becoming really hot. We were trying to merge them so that they could be it could be like a hybrid of those yeah. worlds, and we could capture audiences that enjoy both. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And uh, I think we did that successfully in in the gallows. And um, to kick off the whole process, we we needed money, right, to make this film. We had all the ideas. We had an outline. We needed money. So what we did was we decided to film a pitch trailer or a speculative trailer for the idea. Just moments of the movie. Just, a, just, just moments of it. Moments and glimpses of what the big picture would be, right? So we scrounged up. 250 bucks uh, and <laughs> which was spent all on food, uh, some materials for a costume, uh, I believe. And a the, little bit of camera it stuff. Well, like maybe a camera thing, maybe a, like a DSLR, lens or something. Yeah, for a DSLR. And we cast some local high school kids, some local actors, um, you, you know, who had only done like theater. Mm-hmm. And we filmed this pitch trailer at the Clovis North Performing Arts Center where Travis worked yep. part-time. Yep. Still and do. Still do. Uh, one of my best friends uh, who has helped on several movies uh, runs the place and, and uh, it's great. We pulled out all the stops. We really took a page from the Blair Witch Project where we let the actors really do a lot of the filming. We, we planted people to scare them at mm-hmm. night and like they didn't know what the heck was going on half the time. And we were just like trying to, you know, move the chains, rattle, rattle the walls, drop little things here and there and pound, scare them. Pound in the ceiling and uh, uh, in the attic spaces. It really worked. I mean, we got really genuine performances and scares out of these kids. Oh, yeah. And we also met um, our longtime collaborators now. But at the time, they were just, you know, so young. Tyler Smith and Richie Morellas, who helped create that very first trailer. And they were greener than anything. even us. Yeah, they hadn't done anything movie They basically related. auditioned to be in the movie as like actors because they thought, oh, this is cool what these guys are doing. And then, and yep. then it was just those two and us. It really was. And the actors. We made the trailer. We got it done. Edited it. And it turned out really good. So what do we do next? We created a, a pitch packet. Uh, it listed similar movies. It listed, you know, our goals with 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 the uh, the film. It was basically a business plan. A business plan for the movie. And we had we had comparisons to other films. We said this is the this is kind of the summary of the of the film, and this is how we plan to attack it. We're going to start filming this time. We plan on having an edit going at this time, and then we plan on having something that can release. In the summer of twenty or uh, October twenty twelve, Halloween twenty twelve, and right. and so we're talking about this is like two thousand eleven. Yep, when this is all happening, like mid two thousand eleven, we actually showed a couple people the trailer, the fake trailer of a movie that didn't exist. You showed one of your friends, and he just was blown away with it. Right, there was Marcus? a guy. Yeah, there was a guy in L.A. I showed a couple guys in L.A. and we at the time I think we were thinking we could raise uh, maybe like 20 or 30 grand, you know, for this movie. Like, cause Travis's previous movie, Gold Fools was shot for literally like 8,000 8, bucks. 8,000 bucks. Yeah. I mean, it's like El Mariachi Over style. Over like two years <laughs> and stuff. Um, So we thought 30 grand, man, we'll be set with that. Yeah. And I showed this trailer to um these guys in LA and they're like, dude, this looks legit. It looks like you spent tens of thousands on this trailer. And I'm like, yeah. whoa, like really? And he's like, yeah, how much, I mean, like how much are you trying to raise? And, and I thought, oh, you know, that gave that. us confidence that we didn't know we had. Right. He thought we could, with that trailer, ask for millions of dollars. Yeah. Mil- like, like two million. Tilly- two million dollars. And we were like, whoa, like, we don't know what we would do with that kind of money. Yeah, like, like I don't know. That's, that's too much. <laughs> big responsibility. So we were like, why don't we ask for a hundred thousand dollars? hundred and fifty. hundred and fifty. Yeah. yeah. So I think a hundred and fifty is where we landed on the budget we were trying to go for. And we- didn't know at the time any real investors anywhere in Fresno or LA or anything. We just had the trailer, we had the pitch packet, we had a plan to get this movie made, but we needed money. That was the that was the big thing in our in our way or stopping us from doing this. We get this call from this guy Brad, and Brad is great because he allowed us to film part of Gold Fools. At his in house. his backyard at his house. We had this beautiful pool and I think he's since sold the home, but it was cool to get this call from him and say, hey, I, I might have about like $10,000 that we, I could invest. And we were like, what? $10,000? That's like more than the entire budget of our last movie. Go yeah. for it. Like, uh, that it sounds was, great. It was crazy. And we were like, oh, yeah, that that could uh, <clears throat> that would yeah. be great. Yeah, well, we can meet and discuss that. And so it was great that he called us. And come to find out later on why he called is because he heard we, of what we were doing. 
And he remembered how we treated his place on set from Gold Fools. Mm -hmm. When we were done, we cleaned it up. We left it better than we found it. I was, he'll tell you this. I was washing dishes mm -hmm. that we used. And he's like, hey, we have, you know, we have people that can do that. And we have a housekeeper. And, and I was like, no, man, I want to leave it better than we found it, you know, mm -hmm. just to make sure that in, that I can have that, uh, you know, understanding that we, we fixed everything and made it even better. And I guess that blew him away enough that he wanted to call and see about investing in our next movie, you yeah. know? So we ended up meeting with Brad with our pitch packet, with our business plan, the comparisons to other movies like Open Water, Blair Witch, yep. Paranormal. And then, um, and then this trailer, which was the yep. cherry on top, actually. We showed him the trailer with his two kids in the room. Um, high school age. High school age kids. And um, after the trailer was over, they were all just kind of in – in silence for a moment, if I remember correctly, they were just like, dad, you know, dad, you know, yeah, kind of like, elbowing, dad. elbowing dad, like, Hey, that was pretty, pretty good stuff. And, uh, Brad was, you know, he had his poker face on. He was very much like, Hey, well, um, guys, this was great. Very informative. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll, you know, I'll take a look at over and, you know, all, all of it and I'll get back to you. Yeah. So we were like, okay, well that was that. Yeah. So next morning, we got this email from Brad saying, hey, guys, I uh, talked to my accountant. We were able to move some things around, and I think I could do $20,000. $20,000. So he, <laughs> after hearing from us, he doubled his investment in the movie. Overnight. <laughs> Overnight. Like it was like he, his he, poker face lasted two seconds, and the next day he's like, "Eh, I'll do twenty instead of 10. yeah, yeah." And I, and he followed it up with, "Can I show this to some people around the office?" And we were like, "Yes, please. <laughs> Don't yeah. let us stop you." And that brings us to lunchtime when we got a another email, another email from Brad saying, "Hey guys, I think we're up to about fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> do you mind if I take it outside of the office?" Meaning to other people that don't work with him. And we said, yeah, we think that would be okay. That'd be okay with us. <laughs> of course. Oh, and it was great. And so he did, and he set up a meeting with several other people. And it was all some of the coolest people, uh, like a UPS driver, a, 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 a widow, a retired widow, uh, a, like a, I don't know. Accountant. Like an yeah. accountant. Yeah. And the rest of an the insurance in, guy. You know, All and, the rest of the people in the office were all uh, collections attorneys, too. Yeah, collections attorneys. Yeah. <laughs> And, and my high school drama teacher, Mrs. Hubka. Of course. Got one, I got one person from Nebraska yes. to, to chime in. Yes. And she's so proud. She's very proud. She's so proud. I and have my other, my other teacher, Mrs. Fakler, who still kicks herself that she didn't get in on that. that. she didn't get in. <laughs> hey, she got to come to the premiere, though. She did. She did. She did. She got to meet uh, Kathy Lee and everything. That that's was, right. That was but, good stuff. But thanks to Brad, really, Brad driving this, and Steve Herdlicka, his business partner, those guys really drove us to getting our full investment uh, uh, at, on the first day of filming we got the last check and we got to 115 was it 115 115 and then we we we, we, said, we let's, said we're good let's we'll leave stop it there, there. Uh, because we wanted to have extra for uh, percentage points to to give to actors and other people that may have needed them when they came on board just to get that stronger commitment and and this is really important here too um we had this business plan. We had, you know, the 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 whole thing laid out. The what we were going to do, release this movie. We had this big meeting too. Big about meeting it. with all the investors in big, their boardroom in in the collections attorneys boardroom. This big table, all these chairs around the room, and just me and Travis, like just these like kids, essentially compared to these people. And we're you know. sliding, we're sliding across the table these uh, these business plans. Like uh, it's like I'm. I just – and here you go. Here's this There's business that. plan. Here's this business plan. And on this business plan, you know, you you look inside and you and it shows that this movie is going to play worldwide. It's going to play around the world. It's going to compete with these other big movies like Open Water, Blair Witch Project, Paranormal Activity. It's mm -hmm. going to be right up there with those movies and this is how it's going to go. And little did we know at the time how improbable or impossible – that really was. We had no idea. We had I mean, no we, idea that this just doesn't really happen. That you can't just take a movie and say, "Oh, I'm going to release it around the world in in, uh, in thousands of theaters." That doesn't really happen. I mean, it it really doesn't. Yeah. And we did not know. We we just had this plan and this vision, and we told this to the investors. And it's a good thing. 
It is a good that, thing. That we did not know this stuff. And in 2011, we, we, we set sail. We started filming The Gallows, then known as Stage Fright. I think actually it was called Stage Fright, but our, our working title on set was The Gallows to hide it, right? I think that right. was like, so That's no one exactly knows the was. real title. So this is, it, this is December-ish of 2011. Yeah. And we have, a, we have our school picked out. Fresno High School. We've been scouting there. We've been going through with risk management. We've been doing all that stuff, um, and uh, really got the whole this, game plan. This great ready. theater. Uh, we we went down and we saw two hundred people in L.A. actors, and we found these four great talented young actors that are just they were a blast, and they really fit the characters that that we were planning, and and uh, we were ready to go. And then uh, two weeks before we were going to start principal photography, we got a call from Fresno High School or someone we'd never spoken to Mm -mm. on the Fresno school board saying, oh, hey, you can't film there. And we were like, what? Yeah, just shutting it down. (laughs) Wait, what? (laughs) We're like, uh, I'm sorry, who are you? And why are you not? aware that risk management is already drawing up paperwork this is, this for this. This is weeks before filming. Two weeks. Literally weeks. And we had everything, the script tailor-made to this location, Fresno High School. And this is the kind of things that you encounter when you're doing This is the kind of filmmaking. stuff that'll totally derail something yeah. that you've been planning for a long time and you're spent money on and all this stuff. And it's just some knucklehead that doesn't understand the process or thinks it's going to be this weird thing or... Or uh, someone who's just aloof and thinks, oh, whatever, we'll just tell them that they can't do it. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't understand that, like, tens of thousands of dollars have been spent or are preparing to be spent on something like this. It was really a a dark time, I remember. It It was awful. We were were contemplating just pulling the plug and being like, well, should we even do this? So we had to scramble and find a new place to film our movie. The theater, you know, that it's such a central piece to the movie. If you've seen the film, you know how big the theater is in it. So we found another theater in town um, that's actually not a school. Fun fact, most of the gallows is not filmed in a school. It's filmed at a Veterans Memorial Auditorium where they do- It's a museum. It's a museum. They do ceremonies there like swearing in, you know, f- police, police officers. And stuff like that. And It used to be this circus in the 20s or 40s yeah, or something. It was- yeah. But it was a great old theater, 100 years old. It looked the part, and it was set up in a way that we could fake the hallways and the sides to make it look like it connected to school. A greater high school. Yeah. yeah, and that's what we did in the, in the film. So we were back on track. We were able to make our movie get going, and we shot the film and had an edit together of that original film within, I, I want to say it was like six months, maybe. Yeah. We got Brandon Jones to do all the amazing sound design and, uh, and Zach Lemon to do score for the end credits. Um, and we were, we were really pumped on how it turned out. I mean, honestly, for our first film together, I mean, it couldn't have come out any better for a, a, an independent film with the resources that we had. We thought it was the most incredible thing. Obviously we made changes before it came out of the theater. But we do still feel like there were nuggets in that original one that supersede the changes that were made. Mm -hmm. Now, quick shameless plug for the (laughs) Blu-ray. Both movies, both versions of the movie are on – yeah, over there, the gallows. Both versions of the movie are on the Blu-ray. That's right. It's not just an alternate ending or deleted scenes. It's alternate movie. Well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to why there's two versions here. Um, So – we had this completed version. Now came the hard part, getting it released worldwide. This is what we promised our investors. We promised ourselves. We promised our actors. This was the plan. But part of our strategy when we told them was that we were going to create a real trailer from this real film, and then we were going to release it as though a major studio was going to release it in theaters. That's exactly. And so – Chris edited together this great trailer. And we actually shot a bunch of stuff specifically for that trailer. Yeah, like new, news footage. And- the, the Almost the entire entirety of that second trailer, which we'll play some of here if you're watching, almost the entirety of that second trailer is footage we shot specifically for the trailer and not in the film. And it was all created to create this like viral um, – phenomenon yeah. surrounding this film which we were pitching and framing as though it were real footage 
being compiled by us filmmakers and augmenting a, a a fictional movie or story, but using real footage from a terrible incident that happened. Right in Beatrice, Nebraska, my yeah. hometown, which is how we kind of came up with the whole idea of the gallows in the first place. We were basing it off of this true story. I'm using air quotes here if you're watching. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we cut this second trailer, right? And we put it online. This one went out online. The original one never did. It is now, but this one was online. We spread it out, tried to get it out as much as we could. And thankfully, it started to get passed around on a lot of uh, blogs and horror sites. Bloody Disgusting, Dread Central. People started picking it up and started saying, Stage Fright. What is this movie, Stage Fright? It's coming out in, in October. I haven't heard about this. This looks cool. Yeah. Uh, wh why haven't I heard about the Tremendum Pictures? Who are these guys? I don't know, but it looks awesome. It looked so legit. And and the blogs, it was like right beneath Thor on one of them. Yep, uh, yep. Chris Hemsworth picture with Thor. And then it was like... Uh, stage fright also coming this, out. This, and remember, we've been living in this Fresno bubble this whole time. No industry knowledge or insider whatever about our movie. This was the first time any public word about stage fright had gotten out there. And it was getting out there. It was getting passed around. It was going viral. Yeah. And we finally started to get calls from different people. We got calls from... <laughs> The Weinstein Company, yeah. <laughs> Dimension Films, you yeah, know, uh, which was their you know horror kind of genre arm. We got calls from um, sales agents, uh, reps, managers, and um, Dean Schneider, Management Three Hundred and Sixty, gave us an email. He shot us an email and he saw our trailer and he's like, "Guys, what's what's the story about this? This is yeah. cool. Is there a movie for this? Is there a movie like, for it? Yes, there is. Can I see it? Well, sure, can. Are you going to be in LA? <laughs> yeah, we're like, oh yeah, yeah, we're we're there right now. We're, we're there. Just, uh, we'll be there in the morning. We're there know? all the time. Man. And he, <laughs> so he uh, he, what people don't know and we haven't talked about much is like our trips to LA to sound design with Brandon Jones took place after his normal work hours. That's right. In the evenings till midnight, one, two in the morning, and then we would drive back from LA to Fresno or. We would sleep in our van, the tremendum uh, van, which is a van we still have. It's it's on a non op uh, registration right now. <laughs> We're saving it so that we can blow it up in something. <laughs> but um, but we we would uh, we would sleep in the van. Uh, it was funny. Chris is shorter than me, and I'm longer, and so I was short enough that I could. Fit. He would sleep crossways on the middle seat, yeah, and then I would sleep under that middle seat. Uh, like crossways, so form like a little cr a cross, like like this. a little yeah. T, yeah, cool. and um, and, uh, and that was a regular thing for us because we would get done with our sound design sessions, you know, two a.m., three a.m., four a.m. Yeah, so we would sleep, and uh, but we made it work. And Brandon was a champ doing those long, late night sessions with us. It, yeah. was, it was such fun times. But Dean Schneider, Dean, the man, yeah, he noticed our trailer. He loved it. We went down to Beverly Hills in the van. Next morning, you know, spent the night. Next morning, we're in the side mirror. We're like primping our hair, yep. brushing our teeth, trying to look all nice and like- I'd forgotten <laughs> gum or something and, and we went into 360. Beverly Hills office, management uh, 360. Wilshire Boulevard, super, super cool. Super we're in this nice. van, the, the valet takes it up and we go in and and uh, we sign in. We're here for Dean Schneider and they're like, okay, is there anything I could get for you? And I was like, you know, could I, I could gum? use a piece of gum. And they brought me the whole pack. A whole unopened pack of Trident. And I knew <laughs> at that moment that that was the management company for us. <laughs> a whole pack of gum. We were like, whoa, this it was place great. is fancy. So we sat down with Dean, who's who's a young go-getter too. He's At the time, he was what, 30? 29. No, he hadn't even turned 30 yet because we went to his 30th birthday party. Yep. So yeah, he must have been 29. And um, he asked if we had a copy of the film and I you know, pulled out the the blu-ray I remember pulling out a blu-ray and yeah. he's like uh do you have a dvd actually I'm like dvd man are you serious like do you want uh, high def high definition right? yeah he's like, like uh, we wanted to give the best of what we had and he's, he's like, asking for like a low res dvd <laughs> we quality give him, we give him crap about that all it's the like, time come on I guess he didn't have a blu-ray player but we left a copy of the movie with him nonetheless and we turned around and drove back to Fresno I mean, that was pretty much it. Yeah. And we were just like hoping, praying the whole way. Like, man, I hope they check it out. Hope they like it. I feel like a couple weeks went by. Two weeks, I think. Another Maybe two, two weeks. weeks. And we hadn't heard anything. And we were, you know, fending off calls from this other sales agent. We were like, man, what do we do? Like, we haven't heard from 360. And we actually had been offered already uh, some stuff for the movie VHS. That's right. For our film to be part of that 
for the Gallows to be part of the VHS uh, – The VHS anthology, anthology saw our original trailer and wanted to include the original trailer as part of the anthology. And that was still kind of on the table too. Yeah, we and, had told – we decided to tell them no because we knew that our movie was a feature and should yeah, be that. yeah. So we were still kind of figuring out what was going to happen. And lo and behold, we got this call back from Dean. And he said that he – well, he said he showed it to someone else as well. Yeah, and I was like, that has to be good because he wouldn't want to waste anyone else's time, that's, right? So that's, like, That's good, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, it has to be good. And he had showed it to a guy named Ben Forkner. They enjoyed it. They liked it. They want to meet with us again. And so we came back down to mm -hmm. Beverly Hills again. We met with Dean and Ben this time in the conference room and they basically made the offer to sign us as clients. They wanted to manage us. They yeah. wanted to manage us. They were impressed with what we had done for, for nothing budget. And we thought, okay, well this is cool. But they also said the next step for the film was to show it to the king of horror himself, Jason Blum. Yeah. Blumhouse Productions, who was the producer the time, of Paranormal Activity. Paranormal Activity, right. We got the film to Jason or they did, I should well, say. Well, to Cooper Samuelson Cooper at Samuelson Blumhouse. Cooper at Blumhouse. Saw the film. And he I loved it. He loved it. I mean, and we had a meeting with Cooper. We discussed, he had some thoughts and and um, discussed like what it would take to bring Blumhouse on board. Well, and then a test screening. Well, we'll have the test screening master up we will. On, on one of the episodes. Because that's important for filmmakers to know how to gauge if their film is well and the process of reshoots. It's been practiced in Hollywood for ever. Yeah. And uh, it's something that's incredibly helpful audience, to filmmakers. Audience feedback, man. It's it's it's. It'll like, teach you things you didn't know you had to to learn or be aware of. Yeah, and at this point, not a lot of people had seen the gallows, other than our friends, the actors, and a few of these sales reps and agents and managers. Yeah. So we hadn't really got a true sense of what an audience would react and how they would react. So that's why they wanted to do this test screening. Yeah. So we had this lot. The it's called the lot. We had a hundred people there. I think eighty eight to 100 people. And we were all sitting in the back. Guyman was there. Guyman's another uh, founding partner of uh, Management 360. And he was on board uh, very much. Co-producer on the gallows. Very excited about the project. And we had Cooper there. And then Jason snuck in. He had headphones in, little AirPods or whatever, earbuds. And he comes in all like, you know, hunched over, like low, lights are dim. And he sits in the back behind us. And we're like, oh, there's Jason. There he is. And anyway, the movie starts. And I got to tell you, man, that, that first screening was great. We got some great reactions, great oh, scares. So there was good. a moment where Guyman, he had his legs kicked he up said on the his railing. Phone, no, he set his phone on the rail. He like balanced it on the rail. There's like a railing in front of him. And he he's when he's scared of something, he, he puts his hand in front of his face. And any of you guys do that? Like you put your hand in front of your face, like something's going to come out of the, the screen and like grab you. <laughs> and you don't want to see, you kind of peek through your fingers. He was doing that. And then a scary moment. I think it was when Ryan pops up. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. You know, he pops up from behind the bed. Uh, and man, Guyman's foot just boom. He just kicked his phone. Launched he kicked it. the rail and launched his phone up down the steps <laughs> to the exit way. And he, it was so funny. Just that reaction was so strong. But it was in those moments that Chris and I knew we had something. Yeah. We were really good in these it guys. It played really well. And and this was confirmed after the screening where they do what's called a focus group. They bring 20 random people from the screening up and they start asking them questions about the movie. And the first question they asked was, how many of you like the movie? And straight away, 18 or 19 out of 20 hands went up. And Travis and I were just like, whoa. Yeah, we, we did. Immediately we did felt like, yeah. And they also started asking like, okay, what kind of movies would you compare it to? And of course, Paranormal Activity came up. And then he follows it up with the question, how many of you guys think it's better than Paranormal this Activity? Was, this was great because we had this guy who was like, he kind of talked like this, you know, man. Yeah. He was like, look, <laughs> I liked it. I thought it was a good movie. And then he's like, you know, but like, I just watched that a paranormal movie and like, this one was way better than that one. You paranormal know? was more like hilarious. It was, paranormal <laughs> was more like hilarious, but this <laughs> one was, was cool. I want to see more Charlie, you know, and like that kind of stuff. And like, we know that Jason Blum is in the room behind us and Chris and I are just like, we're like yeah, we're like, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, and we look over to Dean Schneider, our, our manager, and he's just like, he's like, 
yeah guys yes, yeah one of those. <laughs> yeah just he's <laughs> like stay so cool funny. stay cool he's like stay, keep it cool dean's always like trying to keep us cool yeah he's like but manage expectations man. the questions and answers i mean it was great we learned a lot about the film there was one part of the film that we thought would be fine and it was meant to be a very serious moment but people laughed because of the way a certain actress looked in the scene yeah she like Smile cried. It was a very serious scene. Super very, serious. Very heavy scene. But just because the actress looked, Pfeiffer, she looked like she was smiling yeah. rather than crying, people took it in the wrong way. Yeah. And I mean, was she no, was doing a great job. She was doing The performance was job. great. It's just that look ever since then that's ruined it for me in movies. Yeah. When I see people cry and the smile kind of happens. I saw a movie with Paula Patton in it and she yep. did it too. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, because I think she's well, great. And I think but, we were under an additional you know, kind of radar when well, that's not the right word, but we were under an additional kind of, you know, pressure Micros because it was yeah. microscope because it was found footage. Right. You're, you're presenting everything as real. So that realism was just broken, but yeah. we learned a lot. And so here's, here's where things really start to get interesting because at this point, the movie still belongs to no one. We've made no money. We have no deal. We have no distribution. We still have nothing with this movie. And we other still than, owe people 115,000 bucks. Yeah. We still owe our investors We've got some interest, but we've got nothing yet. So after the screening, we go outside. It's dark. It's late. All the audience has left. And Jason, Dean, Ben, Cooper, they've Guyman, all Guyman, yeah. they've all kind of gathered and huddled in this little, you know, little huddle here. Like they're industry people. We were not. And so we came down and had like a big gulps moment. Yeah, you know, we just we're, like, we're just we just we just bust in there. We're like, hey guys, hey so guys. What, do you, what do you think? You know, like and they they all <laughs> they all like simultaneously look at us like mmm don't be here and, and then dean dean, dean like, kind of hey, ushered us yeah, away like, like hey guys we're just we're gonna talk real quick just give us a just minute give us a minute and we're like and so we're like oh, oh okay shoot. you know like <laughs> tail between our legs you and know like what the heck like we walk over and meet brandon who's still there brandon jones was there with us mind you can we back up just a sec because we did at the end of the movie and at the end of the the uh focus group we did meet jason blum yeah oh yeah and he was like Guys, guys, how did you do that? That movie's just incredible. You made it for 11 cents. <laughs> how much did it cost you? And we told him, it was like basically 100 grand. He's like, what? That's insane. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and if, That's his laugh, by the way. If you think that we're <laughs> like mocking or something, just watch an interview. Look up Jason Blum. Watch an interview. I think he Jason talks like would that. be impressed with our impersonation. I think it's pretty, he pretty would. spot he on. He should be. Um, Jason's awesome. And the movie did do better than they were expecting. It yeah. scored, I like think it was points. like 10 points higher than yeah. it was ex than they expected. Yes. Because Cooper told us before the screening, this is kind of whether they thought the ballpark would be and we did, we did better. And so, it beat the bar for most horror movies. That's right. At least, especially for a first screening. So we were, you know, we're waiting, they're huddled, they're talking. We're with Brandon. We're like, oh man, what's going to happen? What's, what are they talking about over there? You know, we were, we're, we're nervous, nervous. That's right. You know, just trying to stay cool. And the, the huddle kind of just dispersed and we didn't really get an answer that night. We didn't know what the conclusion was other than screening went well. That yeah. was pretty much all we got. And Dean assured us that, you know, they're going to talk and they're going to get back to and us. And look, the, the only thing you can do in situations like that is- High five each other, celebrate the win. Yep. Even if nothing comes of it, you know. Um, the one thing we did hear though is that Jason said, look, it's great. It will do well in the festival circuit. They'll make their money back. But if they want to do, if they want to go have a shot at theaters, they need to smooth some things out, tweak a little bit of things, and it might, it might take another, another hundred K worth of reshoots and and revamps to to, to improve it to the point where well, and that's ultimately the call that we got you know not too much later we got a call well from, we, went, we went and sat in the car yeah that night in the garage remember that and we were looking at each other like dude we're gonna have to go reshoot a bunch of stuff we just spent all our time and life in this and, yeah and dean came back and and was like well think about it guys and it on our way driving back home i think that night we just called him and said, dude, we'll do whatever it takes. We'll do whatever it takes. We were thinking about our our actors and what we promised to them. We were thinking about our investors mm -hmm. and what we promised to them. We were thinking about our promise and commitment to each other, my family. And like, yeah. we're not going to just do festivals. No, we wanted to skip that. Yeah. And we wanted to go to a worldwide theatrical release. That was, was in, in the business, the business plan. plan. <laughs> That's what was in the business plan. Yeah. And so- that was kind of the conclusion from that first screening was essentially the movie's good, but it 
we can do more to make it even better and make it harder for a studio to say no to this. But as long as they knew, I think that we were willing to commit to doing what it took to do the additional they work. Might, but but that was all kind of left on the table that night. Yeah, I, I think we got a call confirming that at some point later on, and that and that for sure Blum was in. Yeah, and if we, we went were down in, to the Blum House Halloween haunted house, that's right, and then we discussed it there, and 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 then we were in. We were we were planning the reshoots for the gallows. And we were off onto this adventure of, you know, adding, tweaking, making it as good as it could be. And really, honestly, this is something I'm sure we'll touch more on in this podcast. But this was a rare opportunity for filmmakers to get a chance to do something over in their film. And I'm not talking about just pick up shots. I'm talking about refilming scenes, rethinking plot points, redoing giant chunks of a film. Yeah. And having a second shot at that. I mean, that. It was pretty incredible for us as filmmakers to learn lessons in that way and and really kind of take a first draft and do a second draft of a movie. Even better. Usually there's no money or resources to do anything like this with a movie. Yeah, or just availability. So, you get yeah. talent that is like they only had that week. It's very unusual yeah. to do reshoots of this scale. You hear about big movies sometimes doing reshoots like this, like Justice League and stuff like that. I mean – even with big movies, it's it's fairly rare that reshoots of this magnitude or incredibly difficult. Like yeah. there was a, a Wet Hot American Summer remake, which a friend of mine from high school was in. That I'd love to work with her again. We, I haven't had that opportunity yet, but they said that they filmed one scene that had all of them in it, but none of them could get together at the same time for it to happen. Mm -hmm. So they motion controlled the whole thing. There you go, and set up, you know. The days that they had the people, they would just set up that rig and then motion control them in a scene. And so everyone's like comp composited into the same frame, yeah. but they're not all there at the same time. So it's a massive undertaking when you have to do stuff like that. And we had, we had the opportunity to do it. We had a, it was much bigger uh, opportunity than we had anticipated yeah. because we ended up having to reshoot most of the movie. Yeah. And that's where we're getting to. We, we met with the actors, um, the four main actors who would start in the, three weeks, the original cut. Three weeks before we were going to start reshooting. I mean, it was very close and it, only about six months had gone by. It wasn't a lot of time between the first cut and these reshoots. And we, of course, sent emails saying, hey, guys, stuff's coming. We're going to be doing some reshoots. Maintain your appearance. We're going to be coming back. You know, camp's going to be back in session. And they were all excited, ready to go. We were at 360, the office, and the four actors come in. Dean gets to meet them all for the first time. It was exciting, right? They come in and- But one of them- One of them- He did not recognize. Nor did we, really. We didn't really either. She had lost what turns out to be about 40 pounds- uh, and just looked completely different, completely totally different. Totally different. We, I mean, we're talking full body transformation. Yeah, like none of the stuff that we had in the film of her looked like the same person. Looked like the same person. So anything we shot with the new her would not line up with the old her. And this so, was immediately, like immediately, like we realized this when yeah, we saw before her. Before the meeting, it made the yeah. meeting very awkward for everyone. We, as soon as we saw her, we're like, oh crap, we're in deep doo doo you know yeah. like this is going to be a problem and um and anyway so we were racking our brains the we, whole meeting and then when the actors left we all were just like okay what do we do she looks so different like we can't keep And anything. she looked good before too yeah. she looked great I was like what the heck like what well, anyway she, she's doing modeling now and she looks amazing and all that stuff but I thought she looked great before so for well, us, it was really a bummer to not be able to use her. It just put us in a bind because she looked, like you said, she looked so different that there was nothing we could film that would match what we had. And now her new look no longer matched the character that we wanted. She ne she didn't look like a normal Nebraska high school cheerleader anymore. Yeah, we were going to keep a Victoria's Secret model. At this point in the story, we were kind of left with a fork in the road, right? We have, we got to figure out how to achieve these massive reshoots with now possibly getting a new character, a new cast member. In, well, we were going to keep all of Kennedy's stuff. Kennedy yeah. was the actress's name and we were going to keep all her stuff and we were going to reshoot maybe 40, 45% of the film. But with this change, it's going to take it to more like 80, 85% reshoots, yeah. almost reshooting the entire movie. So needless to say, we were very, um, 
down. <laughs> we were all just like deflated. Yeah, I mean like, that's another thing like losing the school 2 yeah. weeks before you're filming. Uh you you lose an actor 2 weeks before and you think you're going to be okay. It's just it could totally take anyone out mm -hmm. and and cause you to quit essentially. And we were coming up on close to 2 years into the entirety of this project at this point like yeah. from script to filming to this point now with with Blumhouse and 360 almost two years of our lives have been devoted to this film. And we're talking about like not employed for me. Yeah. Uh, me or neither. doing side <laughs> jobs, working part-time at that performing arts center uh, and, and uh, you know, just struggling. Yeah. At the time, I mean, before we started Gallows, we were doing gigs here and there, like commercial stuff. But obviously since we started filming it, that all had to go by the wayside because we were putting everything into this movie. So we had no income and we were about to make a decision that would add Potentially another year. With not money for us exactly. in that decision. So that day at the office at 360, we're racking our brains trying to figure out what we're going to do. And another manager in the office, Bo Swayze, came in and he said, hey, I might have a client who you guys should take a look at. She could be a good fit. Yeah. And we're just like, okay, you know, we're all depressed. And he pulls up on the laptop. He's like, you know, hey, what do you think of her? And he pulls up this picture of Kathy Lee Gifford. Yeah. Uh, I was like, well, it's this girl next to Kathy Lee yeah. Gifford. And I'm like, what? We immediately recognized Kathy Lee. I was like, what is she, like friends with Kathy Lee Gifford? <laughs> that's kind of weird. Like, that's cool. And he's like, oh, no, that's her daughter. And I was like, what? Yeah, Kathy Lee's her mom. It's, her name's Cassidy. And we're like, Cassidy Gifford? Yeah, yeah. Kathy Lee's daughter? <laughs> Took us a moment to like do the math because we yeah. were just like so drained from well, this Well, we didn't, we just didn't have... Uh, any connection to anyone with any kind of celebrity well, or exactly or no. we we thought because of the nature of this movie it had to be a nobody it had to be a new face it had to be someone who came out of nowhere for the for the right. for the you know found footage aspect of you, you don't do julia roberts in a found footage movie because everyone knows it's not real it's julia roberts but at that time cassidy hadn't done much yet she she Yes, she was of famous lineage, but she hadn't done very many movies or very many projects yet. So this was still relatively new for her. And we said, sure, we'll meet her. Like, she's got a great look. Like, she, let's let's meet her, you know? Yeah, it was and interesting. The name Kennedy was the name that we used in the film, uh, the first version of the film. And then Cassidy also sounded similar. similar so yeah. we're in, in our minds, it's like, oh, that's funny because you can kind of dub something. Yeah. If someone says, you can at least keep some of that stuff, maybe. That's right. So we, Bo was like, yeah, let me call her. And so he actually got her to come in that day while we were there in the office. And I'm sitting, um, looking at the front door. Travis is sitting with his back sort of to the front door of the office. And I see the sliding glass doors come open and in walks Kathy Lee and Cassidy. And I, I, I say to Travis, I'm like, Travis, Kathy Lee's with her. It's Kathy Lee's here. I was, <laughs> I was like, what? Because my mom... I watched Regis and Kathy Lee yeah. forever. Loved that She's show. She's a big deal, man. And I was just like, what? Like, I'm just thinking about what I'm going to tell my mom. <laughs> you know? I, think, I think they were going out to dinner that night. So they just happened to be together and and make this meeting work, which yeah. is awesome. And and of course, so we just had a quick, you know, five, 10 minute meeting with Cassidy and, and Kathy Lee. Told them a little bit about the project, the, the, the sort of, you know, hole we were in right now with, with the recasting and whatnot. And she seemed super nice. She super was so like, she's so full of gratitude. Very grateful. Cassidy is so full of gratitude. Anyone that gets a chance to work with her is going to think she's overly nice. She's an angel. Always <laughs> says please and thank you. You can tell she learned good manners from her mom uh, and dad and uh, rest his soul. But they, they're just, they're a kind family. Good people. And we met with them and- Eventually even did a an audition with Cassidy. So we we weren't sure if the chemistry was going to work. Because it really is a free-flowing movie. They really are riffing off of each other. So they, they had to really like each other and work with each other, you know? Yeah. And we did an audition. She did great. And they did yeah. they did meld very she well. She earned it. I mean, she really earned it. We'd, we'd seen a bunch of other people just to be certain. And then when we had her audition with the other talent... It, it was great. It was a no-brainer at energy. that point. Good energy. She's a great person to work with. And it was one of those things where you think the world is going to end. And and it turned out that having her on set was was an even better joy and it made it more fun. And it was- She it, upped the game on she set. She did. She really elevated the movie and, and brought everyone up. And I think we have a better movie because of it. Yeah. And also, 
she she was also great when it came to the promotion of the film because she had all these amazing contacts and people who wanted to she was on the show with her mom you know yeah. and and it just worked out really well but at that time we still had a whole mountain of work ahead of us because yeah. we had to reshoot this movie yeah. and it was it was just a lot it, it this was 2013 now going into you know like basically all of 2013 we spent remaking the gallows or stage fright which yeah. then became all these other titles but we've got a new crew management 360 and blumhouse came in to help support these reshoots financially it was the first time 360 had ever done anything like that first time they'd ever invested in a movie yeah which was huge for yeah, money like money this was pretty cool the reshoots though cost the same amount as the first version Hundred thousand for the first version, hundred thousand for the reshoots. For yep. We got two different movies, so that's why we still say today that the movie cost a hundred thousand dollars because the movie that you see in theaters that was a that was totally a whole new movie, movie, yeah, and it did cost that hundred thousand bucks. So we made Gallows version two point oh, yep, and we were ready to test screen that one, and we started that process. Scott, this this probably was two thousand thirteen, two thousand fourteen, and I I love how we've skipped over the actual filmmaking. Like we talked about, and then we made the movie and then we tested it, you know, but yeah, there's like, like so many things in that. <laughs> Just made the movie. That that can be talked about or brought we'll, up we'll or some clips that will add to the. We're, we'll definitely go more in depth into that process for sure in future episodes. It was a grueling, you know, amount of work with great people, fun experiences, a lot of memories, but um, the milestones here. When yeah. we finished this second version of Gallows version two, which, you know, going on three years here. We went and had another test screening. Another test screening. And that test screening was even better. Even better. I think we jumped like 10 or 12 points above the previous one. Yeah. And so we knew that the reshoots were working. Cassidy was working. Everything was working a lot better. So now was the time where Jason and 360 and Cooper, everyone was like, okay, now we need to find a home for it. We got it. We got to. Someone needs to take this movie and release it because if you don't understand, you know, kind of how the industry works, distributors are the ones that put the movie out, release movies. Jason and Blumhouse, they they can distribute movies, but they are producers. Same with 360 and, and they are they also create managers. The, they create the product. Right. And then they sell it to the distribution companies who then put it on their shelves, so to speak, which is in the movie theaters. Exactly. And the, ex the exhibitors are also their own thing. It's like – a theater is like Walmart. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. the, the distributor is like the person that would make DVDs and put them in Walmart. Do you see what I'm saying? And yeah. then the producer makes producer makes the movie, distributor makes the assets to deliver to theaters, the theaters display them, people pay the theaters yeah. to get this. And it kind of trickles back. And because, because we made this movie independently, obviously there was no distributor yet no one right. no one was on board to release this movie we needed a home for it a so worldwide theatrical release we got to get that worldwide theatrical release so jason says let's do a test screening for uh universal he had he had just come off of getting a first look deal with universal with universal and and they were going to have a big dog over at universal come to this screening michael moses as well as the marketing department from this uh from universal so we set up a Big old screening. This was a big Was that one. at Winnetka? I think so. It, it was, was 300 plus seats. 300 people. It was huge. Yeah. And I won't even get into the whole Blu-ray oh, issues man. that we had leading up to it that. It was nerve wracking. It was crazy. We almost we almost missed it and we're late because we had to make some tweaks on the big screen. We saw, noticed some things in the test screening earlier that morning. The train came and like blocked us. It was right there. <laughs> we were trying to do all this stuff and it was it was a... A whole other story. I mean, but, it was literally just me, Travis, and Brandon Jones doing all this stuff. But we made it, and uh, the screening went great. It was huge. I mean, the, the screams, the screams, and and stuff felt in the first screening was just amplified in this one because there was more people. The yeah. scares were better. Everything was better, elevated. Everyone agreed. PG thirteen, uh, a great movie to scare kids. Blah blah blah. All that stuff. And the marketing, Michael Moses did not make this screening, nope. but his marketing team did. Some of the members. And they were talking about how great it would be to market it, how much they loved it, and easier than like trying to market, you know, a mirror or a piece of furniture from some <laughs> other movies they that they were had passed on. And we thought these guys are going to go back to Michael Moses and tell him this thing was great. We want to market this thing. It's going to be a piece of cake. Yeah, it didn't happen. Didn't happen. Nothing. Nothing from Universal. With and, not really an explanation as to why either. Right. We and, never heard. 
And then Jason decided to do something he had never done. And he got the scores from that. And he gets a book, like a data book. Uh, and he took that book and he passed it on. He forwarded it on to a bunch of distributors saying, hey, guys, this play, this movie needs a home. It's one of the highest testing original movies, uh, original movies that we've done. And uh, we need a home for it. So we're going to have a screening. And they invited- uh, Which was very bold, by the way. According to Dean and the 360 guys, that's not really done. Like, yeah, like really it's kind that. of like not proper yeah. to, it's pretty to bold. pass along the data and the information. But it's like, hey, look at the numbers. Yeah. And, and that's great. And it was a real simple email. He just sent out to everyone. Yeah, to a bunch of people. And uh, Relativity was on there, Lionsgate, uh, uh, all kinds, Dimension. Um, and there was a- there was a company that we've all heard of, New Line New Cinema, Line Cinema yeah. that had not acquired a movie in eight years. They only really produced their own movies and distributed their own movies. Dean was like, "Yeah, we'll invite them. I don't know if that's." They threw him gonna... on the list yeah. just because. Just because. And what the heck? And turns out, New Line uh, Dave Newstadter attended our next next screening. This big attended big distributor screening. screening, yeah. And along with people at Sony and Relativity, all these all these other distributors as well. Lionsgate. And at Lionsgate. And uh, anyway, he loved it. Uh, Lionsgate also loved it too. There's a guy named Jason. Um, Constantine. Constantine, who was hilarious. And he just couldn't believe, he, he saw how young Chris was. He's like, what? You're kidding me. After the screening, I literally, I walk up to him. I think Travis introduced me as one of the co-directors. I was co -directors. like, hey, he's, we're the director. This is the director And he right was here. literally like, are you serious? Like, this <laughs> kid just got out of junior high. What the heck? And it was so funny. But he was so complimentary of the film. He really he loved it. He was like, it's, this is amazing. How did you guys do this? Blah, 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 blah. And we thought for sure they would make a play for it. We thought yeah. for sure Lionsgate would 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 send Or something. they would end up with it, you know? Yeah. And then we actually later on on a call with Jason Blum, he was like, oh my gosh, this was, that's so great to, that's so great to hear those things from Jason Constantine. He can never impress him. <laughs> he's like, uh, he he's seen a bunch of my movies and hasn't liked any of them. Yeah. You know? It's like, uh, so it was really neat to get that praise from, from Constantine and, and Lionsgate. So- but also Dave Newstadter from New Line, he had gone into the bathroom where some of the other like crowd, not just because they had regular people come in to view the movie while these uh, uh, big studio distributors were in the theater also to get more audience fillers. And he was asking some of the people, like, oh man, what do you think? You know, while, while they're going to the bathroom, oh, that's a pretty crazy movie. And the guy was like, yeah, man, I'm pumped. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling jacked. I'm going to go to the gym right now. I can't wait to see that movie again when it hits theaters. And and Dave was just like, oh, I'm hearing that. And like some other guy was like, yeah, man, that was crazy. That was scary, you know? And he's hearing all this good stuff. And then he's like, he said, I just, I picked up the phone and I called Carolyn at, uh, at, uh, at New Line, his, you know, his superior or, I, 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 uh, she wasn't the president then no, but at the time. Yeah. She was like head of, of development or acquisitions, even though they hadn't been inquiring. And he says, hey, Carolyn, I know we don't like buy movies. And she's like, well, what do you got? Like, we might. We Just because we haven't in the recent, yeah. in recent history. Well, she's like, we're mean, new line. We can do whatever we want. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, they, decided, they decided to take a look more into it. And then they, they made a play. And they went up against a couple other people uh, in the negotiations. And then uh, we had this great guy at CAA, Micah, who helped negotiate the whole thing. And uh, man, it, uh, it turned out that New Line made a great offer, an offer we couldn't refuse. And uh, WB was like their backing also. So they kind of both came in on the film and we were just going, oh the, my god!" The excitement gosh. level from from us and, and 360 as well, Dean, like, I mean, it was huge. Because like Warner, when you think movie studios, Warner Brothers, you know, like it's-, it's WB, I mean, Batman, the original Batman is like your favorite movie. And yeah. before when they were talking to these guys, we were like, oh man, what what if WB picked it up? Like, and and- New Line and WB, and we were just like beside ourselves. We were freaking out. And then we we're like, oh, manage expectations. It, it it could get dropped completely. It could go nowhere. Yeah. Let's just let's just be calm and like let's not literally do backflips. Let's just like wait. And then when we got the call, man, Dean told us, and we were just, I mean, it was complete elation. Yeah. That the, that we were gonna make some money. We were gonna get a big release. We didn't know what it was yet. We didn't know what any of these things were yet. We just knew that it was going to work. And Jason called and said, congratulations, guys, your movie's going to play in theaters at least. We know that much. Yeah. And uh, that was huge as well because any any indie artist getting their movie to play in a theater, 
That's insane. That's still insane. Now, we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. We didn't realize how hard that was. Even now, when we get a movie in theaters, and we've had all of them have had theatrical releases, uh, we are we're just so elated that it happens. Yeah, it's like it's truly incredible, and we're grateful for it every time. Mm -hmm. But we had these great meetings with New Line. We had uh, uh, we talked about additional reshoots, which we were like so sick of, but. They had some ideas they wanted to incorporate in the film to make it stronger. Him, Dave, and, and Walt had great ideas. Richard Brenner and Walt, Kat Carolyn, Walter New, uh, Walter Hamada, Dave Newstadter, Richard uh, these Brenner. Guys. Yeah, yeah. They, they had great ideas. Great ideas, and they were they were super cool to work with. You hear horror stories as you know filmmakers and people. You know, you hear like, "Oh, the sharks! Be careful of the executive producers out there." And it's like, yeah, we oh, was not our experience at all. I we mean, didn't they were, have that experience. They yeah. were awesome and very collaborative and very welcoming of our ideas. Dave was on set with us, you know, doing the slate, carrying the sandbags, and you know, and it was it was awesome. So we did we did a few more reshoots, reshot a couple other scenes again. And we're getting the movie ready for, for for release. And we still were not without, you know, a couple hurdles. Um, one of the big ones that came our way was I was I was in Nebraska having surgery when this happened. Um, April of – was it April of 2015? April, May, June. It came out in July. Yeah, so. I think it was April of 2015. Okay, yeah. Well, we were going to have a theatrical release in – October. October. That's what the original date was. It was going to be Halloween of, of But then a uh, bunch of other movies came out like a Vin Diesel movie, The Witch Hunter or something, The yeah. Last Witch Hunter, and then a couple other ones. And so New Line said, "You know what? Jason's Blum's been having success with movies in the summer. We're just going to do a big summer theatrical release." Yeah, and we were we were like, "Whoa." We're like, "What?" We had gotten word that the Motion Picture Association of America, yes, had reviewed our film and Gave it an R rating. When we had specifically designed this movie to be PG-13. And when every test screening that we had gone to, everyone had agreed it was worthy of a PG-13. Going so far as to, on set, controlling the level of language, the amount of gore we saw, having the actors and everyone, even between takes... Watch their mouths. Yeah, like, hey, watch your language, guys. PG-13, <laughs> offset. On we were literally saying this on a daily basis on set. Hey, guys, PG-13, remember. And for it to come back as an R, we were just totally flabbergasted. We had no idea what they New were talking about. New Line was about. flabbergasted. Jason Blum was fabric flabbergasted. Everyone was in shock. And we were we, – things were moving. The train was moving. It was full steam ahead for this release. And to get this, it, it, was, it was really a big roadblock because – you can fight these things, but it takes a lot of momentum away from the from the strategy, the release strategy, and takes a lot of energy and can take a lot of time. And other movies that New Line had recently put out, like The Conjuring, they were also shot and felt very PG-13. They were just very scary. And so they also got R ratings for them. And New Line did not mind that because they thought that – it was a mature audience. It would kind of make it feel more scary to people just yeah. ahead of time having that already. But so, even before we got to that, we tried to go back and forth with uh, the MPAA and with Jody at New Line sending them, you know, the cut and our notes. And we tried to make changes. We tried to like, like ask like, hey, what is it exactly that is making it R? Well, and they didn't give us very good examples. They said language at first. And then we had them like, what? rewatch. And rewatch it's like, it. no, nope. no language. In we the made sure because, you know, and uh, Jody, who's in, in the uh, post-production, head of post-production at New Line was saying, yeah, I said, if you knew these two guys, they're like the <laughs> nicest, like cleanest, sweet, cleanest guys. They, they did not make this for R. You got to watch it again. So they rewatched again. And then they're like, uh, maybe for gore. And we're like, no, there's no gore in the movie. The goriest part of the movie is like you used in the trailer. Like it's showing her neck. That's like bloody, you know, like, or just, or bruised, bruised. not even bloody. And like, so ultimately what they said they came down to is disturbing, violent content. Yeah. Is that what it says on the poster, on the poster yeah, back there? R for disturbing, Some violent, disturbing content. violent content. So Boo. basically what that means is there is no finite answer as to why it's R other than it's just disturbingly scary throughout. And we think that it's attributed to just the realism, the found footage. You know, it, it was kind of a backhanded compliment, if you know, a yeah. little slap on the wrist. It, because it was like we made a scary movie that was effective, effective enough that it was R. And, and – 
it, we, but even with the hangings, so that that was the other. That well, we went back and we looked at movies like Sixth Sense, where it shows kids hanging, Ouija. it shows adults hanging. Ouija that shows people hanging. Uh, the lady in black with the with the skeleton, Harry key. Potter skeleton key, all PG thirteen. The Ring, for crying out loud, The Ring is PG thirteen. None of those movies, had they been watched by our MPAA officials, would have got a PG-13. They all would have been no rated way. R. No way. No way. So to us, we were baffled and dumbfounded. And But after it really going back took, and forth a little bit, everyone just decided to move forward. We had, to, we had to move forward. Even though it took the wind out of our sails, uh, for Travis and I personally a lot, we we didn't, we, we had to- We wanted to make a PG-13 movie. Yeah. And we made it for high school kids. So the idea that they can't buy their own tickets now- is a pain. Now this this created a little bit of a rift between Blumhouse and New Line because well, Jason and, us. and yeah. us. Jason really believed like we did that PG-13 is what it had to be to to be successful. It had to be watched by high school kids. New Line as Travis said, they've had success with these R-rated movies, The Conjuring series, Annabelle. They thought ours fine. It's meant to be R. It's a scary movie. I would say, but I think they weren't taking into account that The Conjuring is like a, a married know. couple, more of a mature audience, not as they, much high school students, exactly, which is our, what exactly. our movie was for. It was tailor-made for high school kids, whereas The Conjuring movies are much more adult in their characters and themes, yeah. arguably. But so so another yet another hurdle uh, in the way. So much so that – when we couldn't get them to back down and, and it, they were sticking to the R rating at the MPA, it started to scare everyone in 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 the, the executives enough that they were questioning whether or not they should even release the movie. New Line. Theatrically. Theatrically. Toby Emmerich, president of New Line, was getting scared. He was like, man, I don't know. Like maybe Jason's right. Maybe maybe it won't survive as an R rated movie. Maybe it, if it's not PG-13, maybe we shouldn't release it at all in theaters. It just goes straight to DVD. Yeah, because they're going to spend millions and millions of dollars marketing our movie that is basically a $100,000 movie. And what it came down to essentially, is, as far as we understand, is Jason said, no, we're not backing down. This we're, is fine. We're going to move go, forward. We're going to move rating. forward. Keep the rating. Embrace it. Let's go. Yeah. Keep the train moving. That's what New Line wanted to do. And so ultimately, we released the movie, obviously, at – with the R rating. We did. Now, when we found out when it was going to get released and how it was going to release, this is the full circle moment. The last final step before the movie was to come out was WB was going to show us the marketing materials they had prepared and also the, the strategy, right? Because we we hadn't heard exact theater numbers. We hadn't heard exactly where it was going to be playing, how it was going to be playing. Nor the actual ads or commercials that were going to be released for the film because we had ideas. As you said early on in this, in this very episode here, you said, you know, we wanted to marry the supernatural with a classic slasher, you know, like mm -hmm. Freddy or Jason, you know, like we wanted Charlie Grimmel, this hangman, to be the next – slasher to be the next horror icon. I mean, we practiced these things and talked about them all the time as if they were real. Yeah. You said in the van one time, uh, uh, Jason has his, uh, has his machete, you know? Yeah. Uh, Freddie's got, Freddy's his, claws. got his claws yeah. and, and Charlie has his noose. Yes. You know? And, uh, so we had envisioned these things and without even talking to them, about those things. That's some of the stuff that they had presented to us. It was amazing to see that manifestation of what we put out there, even though we didn't speak to that marketing department about those things, that they had brought that back to us. Yeah. we we, we So we gathered in, for this final big meeting uh, as they were getting, we were getting close to the release. And um, for those of you watching on, on YouTube, we'll, we'll throw a picture up here and, and you can see um, it's pretty cool, but Travis and myself gathered with all, all of these people we've been talking about, the entire New Line Cinema team, Carolyn Brenner, Dave Neustadter, Walt Hamada. And then the three, in, 360, 360 was there, Blumhouse, all there, Cooper Jason. and Jason. And then also WB. 
Warner Brothers, legendary Warner Brothers was all there. Like, and we're talking like the big wigs. Yeah, like Sue Kroll, Dan Fellman. Oh my gosh. It was um, awesome to be in that room with these icons and and these legends in he- Hollywood. Heads of worldwide marketing, heads of theatrical, uh, all the <laughs> big, big wigs at Warner Brothers you could imagine. These people that are sliding papers across to us to tell us where our movie's going to go. Dan Fellman is the one that he slid that one across. He goes, guys, Take so, a look at this. This is this is great, guys. We have uh, we got this movie coming out in in two thousand uh, seven hundred theaters across the U.S. and uh, playing in these countries worldwide. And and he slides over a list of sixty three countries, and it's it's just completely overwhelming. Sixty three countries. We we turn it. I think it was a two pager. We turn the page, and there you see that list. It was of all these countries. It was completely overwhelming. Where our movie was going to play. We, the name of our company that we created is Tremendum Pictures. And Tremendum, the meaning of it is it is a feeling of awe associated with an overwhelming experience. That moment was a tremendum. It was a completely overwhelming, wonderful experience. It immediately took me back to that first boardroom when we were seeking investment from the collections attorney, the UPS driver, and the friends of friends. And we slid our paper to them, our business plan. And and then I felt like we jumped in time from that moment to the time Dan Fellman slid that paper back to us. Mm Mm-hmm. Completing our our plan, telling us yes, your movie is going to play in theaters a worldwide. worldwide theatrical release. And again, uh, our our lawyers, our managers, all the people we had come to meet in this journey told us just how wild and how much of an anomaly this was that this independent movie that was made completely outside the system made it this far into the hands of these legends who've produced Matrix and Dark Knight and and you name it. Our movie, our little movie, was yeah. going to be released worldwide and in, in a wide release in the United States. And then they proceeded to show us in this meeting all the trailers, all the clips, all the TV spots they had prepared. And it was just, I mean, I, we had just- I was, I, was, I was very emotional. You were. Carolyn, I remember Carolyn Blackwood like, looked over to you and like, patted you on the back because you, were, you, were, you had tears rolling. I was there I too. I mean, I, pu- I put- what I put my wife through and my kids through and like everything through being just out of work all that time that we're talking like years. This was year four of the whole process. Four and years. We, we, we were kind of coming, coming into this release and, and man, I just, it was totally overwhelming. It was, it was a relief of being drained and it was a fulfillment of, of an achievement we had planned on. And seeing it happen, knowing we had no idea how it would. Just that it would. Was an amazing, amazing, miraculous experience. A tremendum. And I would, I would wish it upon anyone who dares to dream. It's very much a Cinderella story is what we've been told. And, and our, our logo it's as It's lightning well, in a bottle is what they said. To, I was about to say, times, yeah. lightning in a bottle, it's, it's the inspiration for our tremendum animated logo, which uh, we'll show here. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see right now. Lightning in a bottle is what many people called us and said about our movie and that, you know, we'd be lucky one in a million to ever duplicate something like this. And, and it's just, it's, it was just an awesome ride. I mean, we'd the kind of success we would wish on anyone. Anyone. So guys, if you've enjoyed any part of this podcast, please subscribe, like, join, follow, uh, and just listen. If you have questions, Leave them in the comments section of, of wherever you're listening or watching from. Yeah, or message us. Find us on Instagram, Facebook. Send us a message. If you're not on YouTube, drop us a line and ask us your, your questions. Yeah, we want to help encourage filmmakers, people with ideas, uh, and not even just filmmakers, uh, anyone that, again, wants to do something and achieve something great. We just have specific insight on filmmaking that will be good. Anyone that's out there that wants to tell their their own unlikely story. This has been an amazing uh, first episode for us i mean i don't we'll see how it turns out i mean uh, it's yet to be seen. i think it's fun it's gonna be a blast it was to fun continue. to make we we really appreciate all who listened in and watched as well we're excited for our next episode tune in we're gonna have an amazing guest next time 
Um, it should be a lot of fun. Yep. So thanks for joining us on the very first episode of Unlikely Story. <laughs>